Do you understand the meaning of the cross? Do you believe that Jesus' death can make a difference in your life today? Welcome to A Man for All Time, where we'll discover the incomparable Christ who 2,000 years ago demonstrated the depths of unselfish love. By his death, he made it possible for you and me to have a second chance. We can decide today to accept Christ's sacrifice. But why did he choose to die? Join me now as we study more about Calvary's cross. Let's pray tonight as we once again journey to the cross and see anew and afresh the love of that Christ with the nail-scarred hands. Let's pray. Father in heaven, tonight, as we come to this auditorium, we come with different backgrounds. We come with different needs. We come with different longings. We come with different heartaches. But Father, we come. We come to the cross and we ask you to redeem all of our failures and to forgive all of our sins and to lead us into a forever friendship with you. Tonight as we come to the cross and as we experience anew the love of the man for all time, the living Christ, we pray that you'd come to this place here in Orlando. We pray that you'd touch every heart watching by satellite in hundreds of places throughout the United States and Canada and around the world. We pray that you'd come and make us into the men and women that we ought to be and want to be, and often we struggle to be. Heal our hearts, I pray thee, in Christ's name, amen. It was one of the most impressive scenes of the old Soviet Empire. My topic tonight is the meaning of the cross. Now you may wonder, what does the cross have to do with the old Soviet empire steeped in its atheism? The dignitaries that attended Leonid Brezhnev's funeral were ready for the most magnificent display of military hardware proceeding through Red Square in the history of the old Soviet Empire. All the dignitaries were there in Red Square. All the top military brass was there. All of the atheistic communist leaders were there in Red Square. Many heads of state were there. They were there to pay their last respects to Leonid Brezhnev. He lay in a coffin. Wave after wave, column after column, of Red Army communist soldiers march by. Wave after wave of tanks and missiles paraded by. The dignitaries stood there in awe. Everything was choreographed. Everything was designed for those Soviet television cameras to show the world the military might and the military hardware of the old Soviet Union. The cameras zeroed in on one woman, the widow of Leonid Brezhnev. She made her way with tears streaming down her cheeks to his coffin. When she arrived there, she did something that shocked the world. At the funeral of Leonid Brezhnev, the Soviet leader's widow approached his coffin and did something quite remarkable. What was it? She made the sign of the cross. The communist world was stunned. President George Bush Sr., who was there at the event, reported it later as one of the significant moments and surprises of his presidency. 
Can you imagine that? The widow of an atheistic communist leader, the widow of a leader who is known for his humanism and secularism and dismissing God from his life at his very death, at the time of her deepest need, at the time when her heart was broken, at the time when her heart needed healing, his own widow did not sense that that healing would come from godless atheism. She didn't sense that it would come from materialism or secularism or humanism because atheism does not provide you hope at a time of death. She made the sign of the cross because at a time of brokenness, at a time of need, at a time of your deepest sorrow, you need again the cross. What is the meaning of the cross for you and for me today? What does the cross say to us here in Orlando, Florida, at a place called Forest Lake Academy? What does the cross say to a woman going through the trauma of a divorce watching this telecast in Los Angeles? What does the cross say to a young person, 19 years old, who believes he's ruined his life with his failures and mistakes, and happens to wander in to a little church in Montana and is watching the broadcast. What does the cross say to an African struggling with poverty in a little village that has a satellite network dish installed in Kamasi, outside of Kamasi, Ghana? What does the cross say to a secular businessman that's gone bust and his business has gone turned around gone down the tubes in Chile. You see, was the cross simply a theological statement, simply something that we store away in our minds, something that Christ did 2,000 years ago? Or is the cross something planted in the center of our hearts, in the center of our lives, that transforms us and changes us profoundly from within. Tonight I want to look at three aspects of the cross. Three things that the cross says to you and me. First, the cross says something about failure. When I come to the cross and I see nails driven through the hands of Jesus and I notice the blood spurting down his wrists and I see the crown of thorns jammed upon his head and I look at the spear wound in his side. From a human perspective, if you and I were there that day, we would have said, not knowing the future, Jesus is a failure. What do you think Caiaphas said? Do you think Caiaphas, the high priest that tried Jesus, thought that the cross was a success? Not at all. He thought it was a failure. He thought Jesus was a religious imposter and the cross was a failure. What about Pilate, did he see the cross as a great success? Not at all. Pilate saw it as a failure. What about Herod? He saw Jesus as a failure. Maybe he thought Jesus had some wisdom, but he saw his death on the cross as a failure. What about Jesus' closest friends? They thought that the cross was a failure. And for all humanity who looked at the cross on Friday, they thought it was a failure. Look, though, at Romans chapter 8, verse 32. The Bible says, He, that is Christ, who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? From God's perspective, Christ was delivered up for us all. There was something more going on there than a man with nails through his hands and a man with blood running down his face and a man with a spear wound in his side. Something much more was going on there that Friday afternoon than human eyes could see. Something much more going on there that Friday afternoon than human hearts could understand and human wisdom could fathom or figure out. Something was much more going on there that Friday afternoon. Come with me to the cross that Friday afternoon. It was Friday, dark, dark, Friday. 
They drove nails through his hands. They put a crown of thorns upon his head. They put a spear wound in his side. It was Friday, dark, dark Friday. The cloud shadowed over the cross. The rain came down and the thunder crashed and the lightning flashed and the earth quaked and trembled. It was dark, dark Friday. And Judas betrayed him and Peter denied him and the Jews forsook him and the disciples fled from the cross and the Romans crucified him and it was dark, dark Friday. The flowers hung their heads and drooped that Friday. The angels cried that Friday and heaven wept that Friday and the father turned away from the agony that Friday. It was dark, dark Friday and they hung him on the cross. But what human beings did not understand is the passage of Romans that we read that Christ gave himself up for us all. And Friday was not a colossal failure, it was a glorious triumph. For the blood shed by Jesus was a blood to redeem all of our failures, a blood to forgive all of our sins. Ladies and gentlemen tonight, friend of mine tonight, listen to me. If Jesus Christ can take nails and turn defeat into victory, if Jesus Christ can take a crown of thorns and turn defeat into victory, if Jesus Christ can take a spear and turn defeat into victory, if Jesus Christ can take a blood-stained cross and turn that apparent failure that human beings see into victory so the cross comes not an instrument of death but an instrument of salvation, if Jesus can take the most colossal thing that Satan could throw against him, death, and if Jesus could take this apparent failure and turn it into victory, Jesus can take every failure in your life and turn it into victory. Jesus can take a broken marriage and turn your life still into victory. Jesus can take the scars of emotional bruising in childhood and heal your heart and turn it into victory. There is healing that flows from the cross, healing for our mistakes, healing for our failures, healing for all the sins that others have done against us. There is healing. Jesus can take that shattered, broken, scarred life and turn all that sorrow into joy all that defeat into victory when you feel that your life is like a bottle and somebody's taken it and thrown it against a brick wall and shattered it into pieces when you feel like Humpty Dumpty. You know that old poem, Humpty Dumpty? Sat upon a wall. Humpty Dumpty, you know it, what is it? Had a great fall. And all the king's horses and all the king's men could not put what? Humpty Dumpty together again. What human beings cannot do, Jesus Christ can do. And on the cross, he showed you he loved you. On the cross, he took the nails through his hands for you. On the cross, he took for you the crown of thorns. On the cross, he took for you that spear wound in his side. On the cross, Jesus Christ took everything that Satan could throw at him. You see, the disciples really didn't understand. They were locked in fear in the upper room. But while they were locked in fear, Jesus' apparent failure was a mighty, glorious triumph and an amazing success. At the cross, sorrow turns to joy. At the cross, defeat turns to victory. At the cross, in the night of my agony, the sun rises again and there is hope because Jesus on the cross is vanquishing Satan. Jesus on the cross is showing before a waiting world in a watching universe the immense, incredible love of God. He is showing how much he cares. And hallelujah, at the cross, God overcomes our failure. Because although on the cross he bowed his head and died, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And in the sorrow of life and the disappointment of life, when sickness afflicts your body, when the family is torn apart, when you look back over your life and there are emotional scars, when you struggle with a lack of self-esteem, when you're ripped apart inside, when guilt plagues you, again with Jesus on the cross, we can say, Father, into thy hands I command my spirit. Lord, I give you my life because I know that you revealed your love for me on the cross, and I know any Christ who loves me enough to come to the cross, you see, on the cross, Jesus suffered emotional pain. On the cross, Jesus suffered psychological pain. On the cross, Jesus suffered 
guilt on the cross, Jesus suffered physical pain. All the pain you experience, all the pain you go through, all the heartache that racks your body, it racked Jesus' physical, mental, and emotional spirit too. And from that cross, there flows a stream of love. From that cross, there flows a stream of healing. From that cross, there flows the stream of care and compassion of our God. You know, Satan threw everything he could at Jesus in his life and in his death. And Jesus overcame him. One of the things that the devil does is this. The devil longs to discourage us. And the devil sets up temptations to trip us up. The devil knows your genetic predispositions. He knows the sins you have fallen on before. The devil knows where you are the weakest. And the devil will arrange temptations on your most vulnerable point. If you are tempted and prone to gossip, the devil will arrange circumstances so you'll gossip. If you're tempted to pride, the devil will arrange circumstances so you'll be arrogant and proud. If you're tempted to lust, when you turn on the TV, the devil will parade scenes across the television. Or when you go to a magazine store, he'll parade some magazine before your eyes. He knows your genetic predisposition. He knows where you've failed in the past. If your problem is alcohol, tobacco, or drugs, the devil will work on the area that you're the weakest. He will then get you to fail. And he will say, you have failed so much, you're unworthy to be called a Christian. You have failed so much that you are unworthy of God. And he will say, forget about it, throw in the towel, turn your back and walk away from God because you have failed too much. Some time ago, I read a story about an auction in hell. Now, it's just a fictitious story, so don't hold me to the details. I'm going to get 1,500 letters, and they're going to say, Pastor Mark, you know there's no ever-burning hell in the earth. You know that, that, look, give me a break. It's a story. Get the point. Jesus told the rich man of Lazarus. Here's the story. The story goes like this. There was an auction in hell, and Satan was going out of business. He was going to retire. And so it's a story. And so I'm going to emphasize the story so much you're going to miss the point. So Satan's going to go out of business, and he's, going, and he's auctioning off all his wares. So he auctions off the formula to get angry, and he said, here it is, some evil angel bids, you know, $100,000, you know, and Satan says, I'll take it, I, I need it for retirement. Then he auctions off the formula to lie, 100000 300000 for that. Then he auctions off the formula for lust, and I'll give you this for that. And so he auctions all day, and all these evil imps, they buy this formula, and they buy that formula, you know, and they buy all this stuff. And then Satan's just about ready to go out of business. He has his big bank account to be retiring in. And uh, he has one little bag left with a formula in it. And he says, I'm not auctioning off that. And all these evil angels say, but, but you have to. You're going out of business. We don't want you to come back and be in competition with us. And the devil says, no, no, no. I am not auctioning off that. This is the one formula. The one formula. That if I keep, any time I want to go back into business, I can. And they say, at least tell us what is in that container. And he said, I'll tell you. You guys go out and tempt Christians to sin. And what I will do is once they sin, I will bring out this formula that leads them into discouragement to believe they can't be forgiven and their failures are too great to come back to God, and I will have them where I want them. This is the formula to discourage Christians with their failures. The story is fictitious. The lessons are real. Many a Christian who gets set up by the devil and fails say, Lord, says, Lord, I've sinned. Lord, I've fallen short. Tonight, from the cross, there is healing. From the cross, Jesus came to die to redeem every one of your failures. Everyone in the Christ that died on Friday, 
the Christ with nails through his hands and blood running down his wrists, the Christ with the spear wound in his side, the Christ with the crown of thorns upon his head, the Christ that bowed his head and died on that Friday. They took his body off the cross. It was broken and bruised and battered. They took it off the cross and laid it in the tomb, and he rested there on Saturday. But hallelujah, Sunday morning, an angel came down and said, Son, thy father calleth thee, and the stone was rolled away, and the Roman guards fell over as dead men, and Jesus came out alive. And he is the living Christ. Whatever failure you had in your life, this Christ wants to give you a new beginning. This Christ wants to give you a new start. From the cross there is love. From the cross there is healing. And from that crucifixion weekend there is the resurrection with the living Christ being alive. One sentence from the cross settles it. You know an experience from the life of Abraham Lincoln reveals how one sentence is more powerful than hours and hours and hours of complicated arguments. Back in the 1850s, Abe Lincoln was a lawyer, country lawyer from Illinois. And there was a great debate. And the debate was taking place in Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, actually. And Abe Lincoln went down there to participate in the case. Now, here was the case. A petition was filed to build a bridge in Philadelphia across a river. Now, the problem was that the river went north and south. And the riverboat captains were making a lot of money transporting goods north and south. They knew that if a bridge was built over the river, going east and west, that that bridge would serve as a transportation highway to transport goods, and they would lose a lot of money. So this is what the boat owners did. They put up an argument. And their argument went like this. The bridge will not be safe. And if the bridge collapses, it'll block transportation in the river. The risk is too high, and therefore the bridge should not be built. The bridge owners argued again and again powerfully. The riverboat owners opposed the bridge, and the riverboat owner's lawyer argued for three hours in court that the bridge should not be built, that it was dangerous. He brought in all kind of blueprints to show how dangerous the bridge was. Abraham Lincoln, a country lawyer, got up. And Abraham Lincoln simply said this. He said, I have one question to ask the jury. In America, does a man have more right to go north and south, that's the way the river was going, than to go east and west, that's the way the bridge would go. So Lincoln got up and he said, in America, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, does a person have more right to go north and south than he does east and west? Think about it. And he sat down. The jury deliberated for five minutes, and they said, build the bridge. In America, you've got as much right to go north and south as you do east and west, and east and west as you do north and south. One sentence from the cross settled it. One sentence from the cross. Jesus dying on the cross said, it is finished. Your guilt is over. Your sorrow is over. You don't have to struggle with sin and guilt. It's over. Jesus said, I have come to redeem your failures. One sentence from the cross and the living Christ finishes it in your life. On the cross, as we read in Romans, Jesus freely gives us all things. He gives us peace. He gives us joy. He gives us purpose. He gives us new meaning in our lives, if Satan threw everything he had at Jesus, and Jesus came out of it as a conqueror through his power, the resurrected power of Christ, we can become more than conquerors too. You need not be locked in failure. You need not be locked in sins that merely trip you up again and again and again. At the cross, Jesus redeems our failures. At the cross, Christ forgives us. At the cross, Jesus changes our lives. You see, the cross says something about failure. Whatever failure in your past life, it's over. It's behind you. There is a new start in Christ. Healing grace flows from the cross. At the cross, we find out something about forgiveness.
Come with me, please, to Scripture tonight. And notice Romans chapter 8, verse 33. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Read the next five words with me, please, from the screen. It is God who justifies. What does the word justify mean? It means just as if I'd never sinned. On the cross, Jesus hung there righteous. I am unrighteous. He was perfect. I am imperfect. He was holy. I am unholy. He was righteous. I am unrighteous. And there on the cross, Jesus died the death that I should die so I can live the life that he should live. He took the crown of thorns so I can take the crown of glory. He took the nails in his hands so I could hold the scepter in my hand. He hung on a cross so I can one day sit on a throne and worship him forever and ever and ever and ever. Look at what scripture says. It says, Romans 8 verse 34, who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Do you notice that first question, who is he who condemns? And the response to the question is, no one, Lord, no one. The accusing voices in your head can be done. The accusing voices in your head can be over. Now, my question tonight, is guilt good or is guilt bad? Is guilt good or bad? Is electricity good or bad? Is fire good or bad? Electricity is neither good or bad, correct? Electricity can be bad if you don't know what you're doing and you get 220 volts and you're up on a ladder. But if I go in my house and flip a switch, electricity can be good because it gives me light, right? Guilt in and of itself is neither good or bad. If I violate God's will and knowingly, willingly sin, Guilt becomes a barometer to let me know I've sinned that drives me back to Jesus. So if you feel no guilt and you go into a store and steal something and you feel absolutely no guilt at all, if you go out and run around with some other man or some other woman, not your spouse, and you don't feel any guilt, something is the matter. Jesus says, I have sent the Holy Spirit to convict you of sin. So guilt after I've sinned is a barometer that leads me to Jesus. But once I've come to Jesus, and once I've knelt before him, and I've said, Lord, I deserve to die. I deserve to be up on that cross. You don't deserve to be there. I deserve to be there. And he says, Mark, I took the nails in my hands for you. I took the crown of thorns on my head for you. The blood that ran down my wrists were for you. A spear wound in my side was for you. All of that, my child, is for you. You can go free if you feel guilt after you've confessed your sin. That is psychological guilt that the devil is inflicting, inflicting upon you to destroy you, to destroy the joy and peace that God wants you to have in the Christian life. You see, there's two kinds of guilt. There is moral guilt and there is psychological guilt. Moral guilt is the guilt that I have when I've broken God's law. The way you deal with moral guilt is get on your knees and ask God to forgive you. And that moral guilt is taken away from you. You may actually feel guilty and not be guilty at all. God may have forgiven you, but you may not yet be able to forgive yourself. Once you've confessed your sin, once you've come to God and you say, God, I confess my sin, and you still feel guilty, say consciously to yourself, this is not moral guilt. God is not condemning me. My oversensitive conscience is condemning me for what I have done. But before Jesus, I'm clean. Before Jesus, I'm righteous. Before Jesus, I'm forgiven. Before Jesus, I stand before the throne of God just as if I've never sinned. That which is afflicting me is psychological guilt. Satan, you're giving me psychological guilt. Satan, be gone. May every accusing voice in my head be stopped. In Jesus, that guilt is gone. Because in Jesus, there is no condemnation. At the cross, our guilt is cleansed. 
Christ's forgiveness makes all the difference. He has forgiven us so we can come with a clean conscience. Now the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, notice this, for he, who is that he? God, made him, who is the him? Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Did Jesus ever sin? Did he ever sin, folks? Did he? But did Jesus become sin? Jesus never sinned, but he became sin. Notice what the text says again, back to the screen. He, God, made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. What does that mean? When Jesus hung on the cross, he took upon himself the guilt of all sins of humanity. Jesus experienced the corporate guilt of every sin that was ever committed. Every lustful look and every lustful act and all the guilt of that. Every angry argument, every murder, every child molester, Jesus took the guilt of the, took all the guilt of sin, all of the guilt of that sin weighed upon him. All of the guilt of that sin crushed out his life. The guilt of the sins of all humanity rested upon Christ, and like a magnifying glass with sun shining through that magnifying glass and a piece of paper that ignites it, the corporate guilt of the sins of humanity, all humanity rested upon Christ. Now don't misunderstand me. I only receive forgiveness as I come to Jesus and ask him to forgive me. But had Christ not borne the corporate guilt of humanity on the cross, the guilt of sin would have been so great that every human being would have died by now. But on the cross, there is life that flows to the entire human race, saint or sinner. That life flows from the cross because Christ is bearing all of the guilt of humanity. Now let's probe this a little more deeply. On the cross, Jesus died not merely the first death, but he died what death on the cross? The second death. How many deaths does the Bible describe? It describes two. The first death is the physical death that every human being dies as the result of sin. As the result of Adam and Eve's sin, every human being, unless they're translated to heaven without seeing death like Elijah was, every human being dies as the result of a defiled, decrepit body due to the sin of Adam. We live in a world that's a planet in rebellion, a fragmented world. So the first death is the physical death that all humanity dies. The second death is the eternal death. It is the death that we die as the result of the guilt of our personal sins. The second death is that eternal death when we go into the grave and never, ever, ever come out. It is that second death takes place at the time of the end, when the wicked are fully consumed in the living presence of God in the fires of hell, where the Bible says there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, they are burned up, they are consumed, they're gone forever. But before they lose consciousness in the fires of hell that consume them, they recognize that they're going to be lost forever and ever and ever and ever. They are going to be annihilated and gone, go into the grave and never come out. And that is the agony of hell. It is that sense that you're never going to be in the presence of God and never live again. Now, here's my question. Jesus on the cross experienced, did he experience the first death or the second? If you say he experienced the first, that means there's no salvation. Because he has to redeem me from the second death. So therefore, he has to go into the second death for me. Now, if Jesus on the cross experienced the second death, when did he experience it? Did he experience it before he died, or did he experience it after he died? Well, the Bible says, the living know that they shall die. Help me now, please. But the dead know not what? Anything. So if the dead do not know anything, and there is no conscious existence after death, that means that Jesus experienced the second death while he was still living, correct? So from 12, Jesus hung on the cross from 9 to 3. And as he hung on the cross during that six-hour period of time, 
Darkness enshrouded the cross at 12 o'clock, and Jesus cried out later, My God, my God, why have you what, everybody? Forsaken me. Why did he cry that out? Because the guilt of humanity's sins were so great. The guilt of humanity's sins were resting upon him so heavily that his heart was being torn apart, and he saw the tomb. And although he said before, destroy this body, and in three days I will raise it up again, although he had said that previously to Calvary, while he was hanging on the cross, guilt was so great, all the sins of humanity were so great, the sins of that liar, the sins of that cheater, the sins of that dishonest man, the sins of that immoral person, all of that guilt for all humanity, the guilt of your sins, the guilt of my sins, Jesus was bearing. It was crushing out his life. It was squeezing out his life. And as he hung on the cross, notice what the Bible says. Galatians chapter 3, the Bible says that Jesus bears our curse. All the curse that should have been on you, all the curse that should have been on me was upon him. Galatians 3 verse 13, read it with me please. Christ has redeemed us from the what? From the what? Curse of the law, having become a what? Curse for who? For us. For it is written, curse it is everyone who hangs on the tree. Jesus became a what for us, everybody? A what? Curse before the whole universe, before cherubim and seraphim, before angelic beings, before unfallen worlds. Jesus Christ the spotless Son of God, the one who was worshipped by the angels, the one at, in whose very name angels said, holy, 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 Jesus became a curse for us. Jesus experienced hell. He experienced hell in those last moments on the cross. What is hell? It is the physical and emotional pain of knowing that you are separated from God because of sin. And on the cross, all Jesus could see was the curse of sin. All Jesus could see was the agony of sin. It took that death to release you of condemnation. It took that death to forgive your sins. He offers so much at the cross. He offers redemption for all my failures. He offers forgiveness for all my sins. I cannot turn my back on a love like that. I cannot turn my back on a Christ like that. I can't simply yawn. Oh, boy. And say, ho-hum, I'm tired. What difference does the cross make? I want to walk away from it. When I really understand that Jesus Christ himself experienced the agony of hell for me. That he experienced the curse of sin for me. That he experienced the guilt of sin for me. All I can do is kneel at the foot of the cross and let his love wash me. And let his grace wash me. And let his grace forgive me. Do you know what the unpardonable sin is? You may have heard very many interpretations of the unpardonable sin, but I'll tell you in one sentence simply what it is. The unpardonable sin is the sin you do not bring to Jesus to pardon. Did you get it? The unpardonable sin is the sin you don't bring to Jesus to pardon. Because if you bring it to Jesus to pardon, it is pardonable, therefore it is not unpardonable. The unpardonable sin is the sin you hang on to. The unpardonable sin is the sin you cling to. You do that enough and your heart becomes hardened and you don't care anymore. But every sin you bring to him is pardonable. So the unpardonable sin is the one you don't bring to him to pardon. That makes sense, doesn't it? When he says, come unto me, all you that are burdened and heavy laden. And you come with the guilt and you come with the accusations. You come with all those voices going around in your head that say you're not good enough, and you come. He opens his arms to you, and he says, I had the nails through my hands for you, and I had the crown of thorns on my head for you. And all of that guilt was for you. You see, friend, we can only forgive other people if we have been forgiven ourselves by God. Knowing 
that I'm forgiven by God, knowing that I don't deserve that forgiveness, knowing that he took the curse for me, knowing that he took the guilt for me, knowing that he took the shame for me, I can forgive you because he has forgiven me. And the reason many people cannot forgive others, and the reason they go around with resentment in their lives, and they're filled with bitterness and anger toward other people, is because they've never experienced the full forgiveness of God. When I'm washed in his grace, when I relish in his love, when I know he gave me something I never deserved, I can extend mercy to you because he extended mercy to me. I can forgive you because I know that he has forgiven me. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, read it with me, please. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. The Bible says you have been forgiven so you can forgive. Somebody said, oh, yeah, but sure, Mark. I'm not going to forgive that other person unless they ask me for forgiveness. I'm not going to forgive them unless they come crawling on their hands and knees. Now, forgiveness is not dependent on another's asking you for it. Forgiveness is releasing another from our condemnation because Christ has released us from his condemnation. Now, don't miss that. Let's read it together. Back to the screen. Let's read it. Forgiveness is releasing another from our condemnation because Christ has released us from his condemnation. Forgiveness is not justifying what they have done. Forgiveness is not saying, if a father abused you as a child, oh, it's okay, don't worry about it. That's not forgiveness at all. Forgiveness is not saying to a person that just ripped you off for $10,000, oh, it's okay, I forgive you. But forgiveness is this. Forgiveness is saying in your heart, although that other person hurt me, although they wounded me deeply, and although I cannot justify their behavior or their action, I release them from my condemnation. They have hurt me once, but if I'm filled with condemnation and anger and bitterness toward them, I'm allowing them to hurt me again. And so therefore, because, I have re because Christ has released me from his condemnation, I release them from my condemnation. Because he has forgiven me, I forgive them. Because he has given me mercy when I didn't deserve it, I offer them mercy when they don't deserve it. I do not justify their behavior, but I open my arms with gracious mercy toward that other person and deal with them kindly because although they don't deserve it, I don't deserve for Jesus to deal with me kindly. I don't deserve for Jesus to deal with me graciously. Forgiveness is releasing another from your condemnation because Christ has released you from his condemnation. I would rather forgive and forget than resent and remember. Because resentment destroys you. Resentment takes the sparkle out of your eyes. Resentment takes the smile off your face. Resentment takes the peace out of your heart. And if Jesus, hanging on the cross, looks down at the Roman soldiers that drove spikes through his hands, and if they're dying in agony there with the guilt of all humanity resting upon him, if Jesus said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. We can reach out to others in his love and say, Father, forgive them, because they don't know what they're doing. You know, I was preaching on the forgiveness of Christ in Brazil. And as I was preaching, it was a small meeting, probably 100, 125 people there. They were business people. And I noticed one businessman across the aisle, and he kept looking at the man next to him, the man sitting across the aisle. And he looked at him. During my sermon, he kept looking, kept looking, kept looking. And I thought, I'm just not getting through to this fellow. He's not paying attention at all. I keep preaching, and he just keeps looking at the guy next to him. About halfway through the sermon, I was talking about the cross, talking about the Christ that forgives, talking about the fact that we are forgiven. And this fellow got up halfway through my sermon, walked across the aisle, put his arms around 
a man sitting on the aisle, and they started weeping. At the end of the meeting, they came up to me, and this man said this. He said, I was looking across the aisle, and I wondered, is that my brother? I have not seen my brother for 30 years. Is that my brother? It kind of looks like my brother. And he said, Pastor Mark, 30 years ago, when I was 16, 17 years old, I was graduating from high school. My brother's about eight years older, and he had a very good job. And I went to him and I said, brother, would you help me through college? Once you help me through these four years of college, I'll pay you back. He said, my brother said to me, you don't have the talent to go to college. You don't have the mental capacity to go to college. I know that you're going to be a failure in your life, so why don't you go out and get a job on the streets? He said, I looked at my brother and I said, I will never speak to you again. And he said, for 30 years, I've never seen my brother and I've never spoken to him. But Pastor Mark, as you spoke about forgiveness, as you spoke about grace and mercy, I recognized that all my life I was missing something. All my life there was a bitterness and an anger inside of me. And Pastor Mark, I couldn't help it. Halfway through the sermon I got up and I put my arms around my brother and I said, if Jesus has forgiven me for my failure, brother, after 30 years, I forgive you. And together in the aisle, they wept. At the cross for me, Jesus redeems all my failures. At the cross for me, Jesus forgives all my sins. He takes away the accusation and guilt. And at the cross, Jesus places within my heart a mercy and a forgiveness. And I can forgive because I'm forgiven. God's love breaks barriers down, my friend. God's love does that. At the, cr the cross says something about our failure, we can have a new start. The cross says something about forgiveness, we are forgiven so we can forgive. The cross says something about eternal friendships. That passage by the Apostle Paul makes it so plain, Romans 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? You see, the cross says that tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword cannot separate you from the love of Christ. The cross says nothing that you go through in this life can separate you from the love of Christ. Romans 8, verse 38, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, is able, able to separate us, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus Christ is your friend. Jesus Christ is there at your side. The cross says that you're worth something. The cross says that you're valuable. The cross says that nothing can separate you from his love. He plunged into the agony of the cross for you. In the agony of your life, he's there. He's there reaching out. He's there to put his arms around you. At the cross, there is death and life. You see, if there was no cross, there would be no life. Life and all the good things it brings comes from the cross. You see, Jesus' death brings to you and to me life. Life and all the good things it has comes from the cross. Think about it. The sun that shines. If it wasn't for the cross, the sins of this world would have destroyed all humanity. If it wasn't for the cross, there would be no sun that shines. If it wasn't for the cross, there would be no rain that falls. If it wasn't for the cross, there would be no flowers that bloom in the field. If it wasn't for the cross, there would be no smiles on our faces. If it was not for the cross, there would be no food on our tables. Life and all the good things it brings comes from the cross. If it wasn't for the cross, there would be no friendship. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, he poured out his life so all humanity could enjoy life. The breath that I take comes from the cross. Every heartbeat comes from the cross. At the cross, there is life and death. The cross shows me the life of God, but the cross says something about death. You see, what really killed Jesus on the cross? What really killed him there? God didn't kill Jesus. The Romans didn't kill Jesus. The Jews didn't kill Jesus. 
The cross didn't kill Jesus. What killed Jesus on the cross, everybody? What was it? Sin killed Jesus. Let's suppose that as I was walking here, I tripped over this vase. And as I tripped over the vase, and I knocked these flowers down, and let's suppose after the meeting, let's suppose this was a clay pot, and let's suppose the vase shattered all over the floor. And let's suppose after the meeting, I came to the principal of Forest Lake Academy, and I said, I'm so sorry, but I was on the platform. I was a little clumsy, and I tripped over the vase, and it knocked over on the floor, and it shattered in hundreds of pieces. I, I'm sorry, but I'll give you the $5 or the $10 to, to, to buy a new vase. He looks at me. His mouth drops, big eyes, taps me on the shoulder and says, Preacher, I've got to tell you something. That vase was an antique. There's only one other like it in the world. It cost $25,000. It's an an, in an antique shop in New York. Was I, am I sorrier now than I was five minutes before? What do you think? Why am I sorrier now? Because it costs $25,000, and my wife and I don't have that to pay for the vase. When I really know what sin costs, it makes a difference. When I come to the cross and I see that sin killed Jesus there, when I come to that cross and I see that sin drove those nails through his hands and a spear wound in his side, I lose my appetite for sin because I know that every time I turn my back on him today, and every time I rebel against him today, that it brings sorrow to his heart, it brings disappointment to his heart, and it brings hurt to him. The Bible says in Zechariah 12, verse 10, and I will pour out on the house of David, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace in supplication. Then they will look on me whom they have pierced. They will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one who grieves for his firstborn. Jesus says when we come to the cross, we look upon him who we pierced. The greatest remedy for sin is seeing that my sins brought pain to Jesus there and they bring pain to Jesus now. I don't want to hurt the one that loves me so much, do you? I don't want to hurt the one that gave so much on the cross for me. I want to turn my back on that thing because he loves me. When we see Jesus, the sinless one, nailed to a tree, writhing in agony, suffering in pain because of our sins, we're led to mourning. We're led to a deep sorrow for our sin, and that deep sorrow floods over us at the cross. He redeems me from all my failures. At the cross, he forgives me of all my sins. At the cross, I lay down my rebellion. At the cross, my heart no longer wanders. I come to the one who poured out his life for me. And at the cross, he says, Mark, sin is not worth it. He says, Mark, meditating on the cross makes all the difference because there I see how much he loves me and how much he cared. And I see him pouring out his life for me. And at the cross, I give my life back to him. In the Vietnam War, Saigon was being evacuated. And as it was, an army captain and nurse were on a jeep heading to be picked up by helicopter, and they got word that a Vietnamese orphanage took a direct hit. They got word that there was a little girl bleeding to death, and she needed help immediately. The captain and the nurse raced to the spot. An orphanage staff member made radio contact with this U.S. officer, the doctor, and the nurse. They got there. She was bleeding profusely. There were a few other children around, and the doctor knew immediately what had to be done. Made up a little makeshift tent, tied a tourniquet, tried to stop the bleeding, but soon, in a few hours, this little girl needed blood. And so, they found a boy. And they said to this little boy, would you be willing to give your blood. To save this little girl's life, they tried to explain it to him. And the little boy willingly said, I 
will become a blood donor. As they were taking the blood from the boy, the boy began to cry, and he was crying and crying and weeping. And they kept questioning him and asking him, why are you crying so much? Why are you weeping so much? And he said, oh, because after I give my blood, I will die and she will live. The little boy thought that in the giving of his blood, he would die. And they said to him, why are you doing it then? Why would you be willing to do that? And he said, she is my friend. Tonight, Jesus is your friend. Tonight, there is something to celebrate. The cross transforms our failures. Tonight, there's something to sing about. The cross cleanses away our guilt. Tonight, there is something to celebrate. The cross reveals that Christ is our forever friend. I hear the Savior sing. Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. Friend, do you feel the need for a Savior who can cleanse you from guilt and renew your heart? Jesus desires to erase your past failures. He's ready to forgive everything you willingly confess. His death on Calvary's cross demonstrates just how much he loves you. Can you think of a better friend? Jesus wants to spend eternity with you. Would you like to spend eternity with him? Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your gracious and complete forgiveness. Now give us freedom from guilt and despair. Transform our lives by your grace is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. A Man for All Time, The Incomparable Christ is a series of seven dynamic programs presented by Mark Finley, Speaker Director for It Is Written Television. Each program illustrates how Jesus can meet the deepest needs of the human heart. Visit IIW.org or call 888-664-5573 to order for yourself or share with a friend. Available on VHS and DVD or audio cassette and CD. Experience spiritual renewal with each life-changing program. Call today.